it's so it's so good to see everybody uh whether it's your team number that we see up there beside your name or your name or your fantastic faces um some of you that aren't showing your face uh it's, it's too bad because obviously we have such a good rapport with everybody but um I'm really excited to try to share some more news with you and some details and also to give you a chance to ask any question that you want. So I promise, even against Paul's advice, to not speak for too long <laughs> and to give the floor as a Q&A for everyone. But I, I did prepare a few slides because I know the type of uh, bits of information that are relevant to you. And uh, I'm going to get right to that. So let me share my screen and start with this. And I will just move my cursor around there. So yes, so uh, it's really about taking a closer look. And um, what are the key pieces around event selection, which is just about you know 36 hours from now or somewhere thereabouts. So it's just really 36 hours, oh my goodness, um, 13 hours or whatever, half a day uh, till tomorrow at lunchtime, as you know, at 12 noon, but really you have until next Thursday morning to be finished your event selection without penalty. So that's important to know because a lot of people think, oh my goodness, it's tomorrow, I got to get it in. Like the old days where we all sat there with our computers and I had my whole class waiting, ready to hit the event I wanted and to try to improve those chances. So we'll see where everything goes. So please do um, add questions, um, comments in the chat. Uh, we've got our, our good navigators, Paul and William here to help us along the way to keep me on track mostly, but to also make sure that we're paying attention to the questions that you all have. Um, so without further ado, I am going to um, see if, ah. so, Really, let's talk about the elephant in the room, right? Too often um, uh, things get snuck by or sometimes the community thinks there might be a, a lack of transparency, but that's not what we're about at First Canada. We wanna let you know everything that we know as soon as we can. So the real question is why, and for sure, we're gonna cover that in the next 10 minutes with you. But I thought I would build a bit of a pathway for you, if I can use that term you know, why single day events and other important categories such as event capacities, which is really important to know to help you uh, decide on what events to um, consider sending your team to, in addition to all these other reasons that are there. And also what the dates are. And uh, the, the thing that we all are worried about or afraid of in the past, wait list. So a lot of good news with regard to those. So if I can just now focus on the why and just, I built this little graphic just to kind of help you understand what those key pieces were, what the drivers were that made us come to this conclusion. So with these single day events, we really believe that there's an opportunity to have less travel if that's what suits you, um, which ultimately results in lower costs. Uh, the idea and what we're hearing from a lot of teachers are, I can't get permission from my school board or my principal. I don't know what to say when I go to them. So if you don't know what to say and you haven't got the permission yet, take this to them. The idea that um, the way we've restructured things as far as being COVID friendly, safety built in, more spacious venues, capacities, all of those things allow for a much safer experience for everyone. And um, you know, when you think of 18 teams, one of the questions is, wow, we're like used to 36 teams or 30 teams at the low end uh, in Ontario. But realistically, having lower teams creates more space at the venue, which allows us to be obviously safer and allow you to bring more team members to the event. So one of the things that we thought of was, if we're going to make any changes, let's make sure that we do it with the perspective of the team and the mentor. What, what's going to be important to them? And... Uh, you know, that bottom statement there about single uh, day events um, help us to ensure that we've got sufficient venues to meet the need that's out there. One of the things that's very hard, as you know, you hear us all year long saying to you, can you please register, register, complete registration so that you are event ready. 
Um, the good news is a lot of teams have made a lot of good progress, but there are certain things that will stop you from being able to select your event tomorrow. And uh, we can go into that if there's are brought to us through the Q&A. Uh, I'm not going to mention any of those right now uh, unless um, there's too many other good things to cover for you. But please do ask them in the Q&A if there's anything specific that you want. Um, the other piece that's really important to know is, you know, we really thought about this plan and we looked at what could happen four months from now, five months from now, when the events are about to occur. Now, last year at this time, we thought, hey, it looks like for sure we're going to have events and, um, you know, let's build in measures or parameters to make sure we do so. And then it just was a no at the end of January. The good thing to know now is 100% we're moving forward in our minds with our planning to run in-person events. It's for Ontario, it's in-person events or none, nothing for FRC. So we're not going to shift over to challenges and so on. What I could say is it will only get better. I guess I could say. So here's the key piece for you. This is extremely important. And I really want to emphasize that these are projected. So it's not final. It could change. We tried to pick roughly the low end. And when I say estimates are based on about 50% capacity, it's 18 teams times that number. So the attendance can vary at the different um, venues as you know of. So for example, uh, Waterloo has a capacity of how many versus Humber College versus North York or Victoria Park, which is what the uh, North York uh, event is. It's at the high school, Victoria Park, as well as the St. Mary's School in Hamilton. Because those venues are smaller in terms of the room where the field is, um, the likelihood is that the event capacities or the attendance of team members would be reduced. We'll give you more details about those, but if you're planning on bringing 50 team members to an event, you probably would stay away from the Victoria Park event and St. Mary's. So that's not to say um, that in three months from now, everything will be good. We'll have event capacities higher like we had back in you know, we ran Victoria Park as a qualifying district event way back when. And um, I think we, we averaged something like 30 team members per team. <clears throat> because there's 18 and if capacity goes upwards, you know, 75%, maybe even 100, then these numbers would just increase. So again, it just gets better. So the, the key piece to underpin here is what we've done is we've, we've sort of looked at what's the minimum that we could allow and how can we help communicate that information to teams and allow you to be able to pick the best um, choices for you. Um, I know that Paul and William will interrupt me at any time if they feel they need to regarding questions in the chat. I see the chat is starting to uh, get higher in numbers. So just two more slides here um, before we go into open discussion about everything. Um, Continuing with how we manage this um, selections for events. So let's say this is um, Friday or next Wednesday. Um, and uh, us at First Canada are looking at the events that have been selected by you. Um, what we've done this year, 18 teams, we're holding back half the spots. That means as soon as you go into select your event, it'll say only nine spots available or five or four, depending on how, how it all looks within the uh, lottery system. What I want you to know that's different than all the other years is that we will be putting much more effort into um, assisting you with getting to the event that works best for you. But in order to do that, we need you to really put on your GP hat this year and understand that we have to try to look at the compass that's gonna guide us, which would be location. So for example, and if Nancy, you allow me, I'll pick team 1305. So I have not talked to Nancy about this, just so you all know. But uh, if 1305 wanted to stay local to North Bay, it would make sense that they would want to compete on Saturday and Sunday at their event that's up there. Minimizes the travel, no overnight excursions, all of those pieces that are important. Um, that said, uh, it's up to you to go wherever you want to go. 
So again, there are going to be no restrictions. You're going to be able to choose wherever you want within the scope of a lottery. I have talked to HQ and I'm keeping in touch with them almost on a daily basis. And they have gone into the system to make it easier. So you can pick, um, if, if you go to pick Saturday and the system comes back and says to you, there's only a wait list, do you wanna pick another event or not? You will be able to pick Sunday um, right away as your first choice. So again, that's up to you. But do try to use your guiding point as where do you want your two days to be and pick accordingly. Um, there are a lot of intricacies that are involved in your rationale as to why you would pick one event, one or two venues and so on, whether that goes through um, just the overall team experience, your limitations or no limitations around travel. Depending on uh, community teams may have less restrictions than a a school team, for example. And then the other piece is um, the only caveat in all of the single day piece is that a single venue that has two back to back single day events share the judged awards. So that's the one piece to be aware of. And we are looking at um, that's an ever evolving process right now and how we're going to roll that out, but we'll certainly be giving you more details almost on a weekly or bi-weekly basis going forward on exactly what you could expect to see at the actual tournament. Again, my efforts, unless somebody gives me good reason why not to, and I'm open to any feedback from all of you, um, we will look at who's applied at what events, who's on what wait list, and try to get you into the event that's back to back for your purposes. Um, and again, that's only if you want to. And the other thing to remember is in every year, we typically always give rookies priority on which events they want. Also keep in mind that we will have a feel of the landscape and we'll be able to move rookies around in a way that balances their need and with the needs of the rest of the community out there. Here's an example of event preferencing um, this coming weekend or uh, tomorrow. <laughs> uh, so this is directly from headquarters and I, I asked for a scenario. So even though this is straightforward, it's important to read and to understand that um, each day is a separate event. Um, so in an ideal world, you would pick say Saturday, uh, one venue. And if you want the same venue for your second day event on round two, you're gonna pick that event. Maybe you want to say, hey, uh, right now, it looks like day one is already full. I'm going to pick day two and then hope I can pick back up day one afterwards with what I've already explained to you. Um, but what I am saying to you with the statement is that the system will allow you to pick um, Sunday. Um, or you could pick both days as your second preference on that, that first pick with the lottery system. So I hope I haven't confused you further. But this basically is just like treating Saturday and Sunday as two totally separate events. Now we are open for questions. So please, at any time, um, put your hand up. We use the, the tool there to put your hand up if you want to say something or just put stuff in the chat. And Paul and Neil will direct the questions towards us. So uh, we did have a question about the Western event. I think uh, Dave already addressed it, saying it's, it shouldn't be showing on the system, but it is showing on the system. But even so, I don't know if uh, John has any comments about Western at this moment. Well, thank you so much for that. I will double check um, and get that taken off the system right away. There is no Western event. Uh, Beth whoever has her hand. That, whoever Sorry, brought that John. forward, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Bev Carmichael from 1305 has a question, John. Hello, Go ahead, Beth. So with the one day event, there will be no load in the day before. So everything happens from load in to inspecting to all the games, everything. So um, we purposefully didn't put out a draft schedule because uh, we don't know what that schedule is actually going to um, end up looking like but I will share out a schedule probably within a week, which again is a draft. And, but certainly uh, Bev with the planning committees, you will have all of those details uh, pretty darn quick. 
Um, but to answer your question more specifically, the intent would be that there would be an option to load in on the night before and hopefully get some robots calibrated um, if there's any inspection issues and so on. And then there will be a window of load in in the morning also, because again, keeping in mind the primary reason for these changes is that we're allowing uh, the opportunity for teams to minimize the travel. So we don't want you driving somewhere, dropping your robots off, having to stay overnight, come back the next day, stay overnight again, uh, and to do it that way. We are toying with a couple other key pieces that will make the experience even better for teams. Uh, I just can't really release details about that at this point in time, but it would have something to do with uh, finding ways to increase exposure time to you and your robot while you're at the actual event. I hope that answers your question. So we have a- uh... Thank you. We have three additional questions here in the chat, some really great questions that'll fill in some details. The first one I see here is no award presentations, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and I know that John has been working very hard on the uh, awards for this year. So I don't know if you have a comment, John. Thank you. Uh, fantastic question. Uh, they're all great questions and I anticipate even more great questions. Um, I will just say as a sidebar, everyone, that I'm uh, working with a few of the staff members and when we're putting a communication out, we always struggle with how much detail to put in it. And um, uh, my comment back and Paul's comment, who's done a lot of work with supporting teams has been, let's put a few details because we know they're going to ask us the questions anyway, and we'll be able to respond in person. So to address that question, and I'm going to let you rephrase the question one more time, please, just so I make sure I hit it on the head. Are there no award presentations? I, I think that's just an implication of the one day event. There may not be time for award presentations. That's yes. what it said in the chat here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, that is under discussion with headquarters at this point in time. We know what we want to do and we're, we're pushing for that. So we're evolving a draft model right now, potentially. And I'm going to use that word carefully, potentially a hybrid model of um, in-person judging and virtual judging. That's not confirmed yet, though. Um, and there will be some awards that could be given out or recognized. So, for example, Woody Flowers finalists. That has nothing to do with um, both days. It would be some on one day, some on the next day. Um, we will be looking to do potentially a follow-up. Uh, after the event um, to make it equitable for all participants so that, for example, if you participate on Saturday, are we going to announce awards on Sunday? That's not fair to those that were there on Saturday. So what we'll do is we'll have a follow-up, probably a virtual uh, gala every single week that's going to recognize the achievements of our teams at the events and um, inform everyone of who uh, the winners are as far as the judged awards go. The real good news that headquarters is stressing is that you will be able to obviously get your banners and your medals and trophies for your um, playoffs and winning uh, and um, finishing as a runner up to the event. So those pieces will still be in place. So basically think of it this way, anything that could be given out that's not specific to the whole weekend um, will be uh, communicated out uh, during the event. But again, there won't be any advantage to one day over the other. I just want to be very clear about that. We'll be very consistent across every event out there. Great. Uh, so that was the first of a number of questions. Uh, with 18 teams, how will playoffs work? And it says here, one round by for seed one and two. And that was a question. Yeah, uh, again, uh, we've got our group of district key role volunteers, um, which you may have heard that term before, especially those that manage events. So we have our, our lead uh, head ref, our lead um, MC, and all those different, all those capacities, there's eight of them. We are discussing uh, the details of how this is all gonna play out. Um, at the, sorry, William, can you just say the question one more time? Sure. It says with 18 teams, how will playoffs work? And the suggestion in brackets was a one round buy for seed one and two with a question mark. 
Yeah, and you know, there are suggestions such as that. There are the ideas of round robin, what have you. But what it looks like we're going to do, and again, not confirmed yet, but this is um, heavily focused on our radar, is uh, no quarterfinals, but semis and finals. The other piece that that allows is our goal within these tournaments is to create the maximum amount or number of um, qualifying rounds as possible. We know that that's a super priority to teams and we're gonna do everything we can to move that schedule around to make sure that we get the highest number of matches and that's possible. So the next question involves how many teams we're expecting to compete this season. And I think, well, hopefully this meeting will help us because there are about 30 teams that are uh, hesitant uh, just because they need some more details to bring to their school boards or their principals. Uh, I don't know if I should ask John or Paul about this as we were prognosticating about this today. Um, maybe I could uh, see what each of them thinks. I'm going to defer to Paul, who's been the data guru. He's He's like the Pac-Man looking at all the data in the system of anything that y'all have put in or have not entered in this year. Go ahead, Paul. Just couldn't be like a real simple, let's ask Paul kind of introduction. <clears throat> Anyways, so I've been trying to contact teams to make sure they're event ready. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell at this point because uh, we have 161 teams that are event ready that may have changed since this afternoon. We have a list of 201 teams that could potentially compete over the, from the last couple of years. Um, so we really won't know, I don't think, until uh, probably the end of next week. We, one thing that's always surprised me is when we, we do find quite a number of teams, when it opens up, that don't uh, register for an event or go into the lottery right away. So it's, that kind of, makes it a little bit uncertain, but um, I think 160 would be the upper range. If we and meanwhile, that. we've heard from 146 of those teams uh, about their intent to uh, compete this year. And so there's a, that may be uh, another number to consider. So there, yeah, there's a fair number considering um, if competing and of those most have said, yes, they intend to compete. So good conversation there. I want to add to that, that um, we, are, we do our best to analyze the data that we get. And we look at the system and cross-reference everything as much as possible. And we understand that this year has been difficult, a certain amount of trepidation out there on what do I register, don't I register, or I haven't convinced my admin yet to allow me to register and everybody's waiting and you know, one school board might have no extracurriculars while the other one is wide open and all those pieces. So we get that. We know that there's a lot of reasons why not everybody's registered. However, it does look like the numbers are promising. And that's a good thing. And that's partly due to a lot of the real hard work by First Canada staff that have sent out multiple emails um, and had discussions with people to try to get you event ready. So what I would like to do, I'd just like to ask Paul, if he could give me two or three th specific things, just three little points on what would stop me from being able to register tomorrow for an event. Okay, so if you don't have two lead mentors, lead coach mentor one and two, you can't register. If one of those mentors, if either or both of those mentors have not signed their consent and release. Typically that means they haven't gone into their dashboard recently. Or if one of those uh, mentors or both of those mentors has not renewed their YPP if it was due or is in the process of renewing it and it just hasn't come through yet. Those are the three things that could cause you not to be event ready. Excellent. And so the good news is, even if tonight you said, oh my goodness, I gotta go in there and get my YPP done because you haven't have you don't have both mentors done so you, you panic and you, you go do it um, it's going to take a couple of days to get that to go through the system and you won't be able to pick right away but it's okay because in reality you have seven days from tomorrow to finish that first event registration and even if in the worst case scenario you didn't get you weren't unable to secure permission from the school until next Thursday afternoon 
you could still go in and put your first pick in at the same time as do your second pick. So you have those options. You're not blocked out. All right, more so questions? There are yeah, a number of other questions. The next one concerns a video feeds suitable for offsite scouting. And that plays into a very nice element we've been discussing here at first strategies to make it very inclusive, regardless as to whether individuals are able to attend in person or offsite. Yeah, um, so right away when I put my team hat on, I think, okay, what does that mean regarding how many people I can bring to the event? So let's just say it's 20. Do I need to have three scouters? That's now leaving me 17 people to do other tasks another game team of five, that's, and so you start to see how the numbers dwindle quite a bit. It's up to you, obviously, you can do whatever you want on who you make up those 20 or 30 positions, what have you. Um, we are looking at putting, spending more money on improving our feed, um, video feed across the system. Um, we will be doing it geared towards how can we make sure that there's opportunities to do rigorous, authentic scouting virtually. Maybe a good key thing would be that um, one person on your team that is at the event is dedicated to um, relaying key information to your scouting team if they're virtual. So that one piece. And so that way you're, you've got boots on the ground at the same time as virtual. But again, I don't want to um, try to narrate to anybody how you should do it. There's a lot of different ways, but we are again, looking at whatever the changes we made this year, is to make sure everything that you've had in the past is enhanced. So that video feed will be enhanced. We will have extra cameras. We will have, um, it, and as you know this year, uh, pay attention to those dates because one of the things that always gets missed is, oh my goodness, John, I booked week two and I didn't know it was March break. <laughs> they opened the border today, so maybe some of you are gonna go away from March break this year, I don't know. Um, so that could play into your decision making, right? Um, it's going to be a lot harder to, to fix a problem like that for you this year um, because for the priority given to the local teams. But as you decide on how your teams are going to be broken up into who gets to come to the event, that's another situation. I do want to be clear. Most of you know the venues and the capacity. So there's two things that steer the how what the final number for capacity is going to be so we've got 18 teams whatever the human space is allowed by code or by law and so you know how in every gymnasium they'll have a posted on the wall a thousand people permitted in this space right now if under current conditions at 50 percent, that would mean 500 are allowed so then we subtract our volunteers now we have, I don't know, 430 people that could be in there. Divide that by 18. That's how many team members you get to bring. So it's going to be different at every event, but proportionally, it'll be similar. So back to my original point, you know the venues, but there are some intricacies that change that number that you might not be thinking about. So for example, let's think of um, Durham. So Durham feels like a wide, open, spacious venue, in my opinion. But Durham has pits that are separate. But we have to base the teams or the capacities on the gymnasium where the competition is. We just have to do that because we can't have everybody come from the pits into the gymnasium and then suddenly we've got, you know, one and a half times the amount of people that are allowed to be in there. So that's the situation we face with that piece. But I will, um, as soon as I know more details about numbers, I will send that out to you. I will also be uh, rounding up the numbers that you saw on that chart. And again, I'm gonna go back and share my screen um, just on those numbers. In theory, um, Windsor, for example, you know Windsor is a large venue. And even though they're all housed in one big space, that's even more advantageous to allow more people in. So it's possible. Um, you could bring 30, 40 people to the Windsor Essex event, but we don't know what the current COVID protocols would be at that time. Possibly it's better than it is now, but even at now, you, you're gonna have over um, 20 people per team allowed there. The chances are it's going to be more. So there's an example of a venue. We know that Waterloo, although Waterloo overall space size 
is kind of like um, Humber, it's kind of like Georgian, but because they have so many bleachers and they have the two tiers, Waterloo will probably be a larger event and that's why we put it as 20. So I just want you to take away from this point that even though 20 might seem a little bit low, some of those 20s are easily 40 or more. And I think that that meets more than the average of the team members uh, that would come. Back to the questions. So uh, yeah, there are some more great questions on the way here. We have one about details regarding eliminations. I guess the hint came that we'll be starting with semifinals and not quarterfinals. And that would probably just cut everything in half. And uh, then I think that's probably what we're going to do. Uh, the second part of the question though is, uh, if a team competes in both days of a tournament, do they need to load out and load in? And I would guess no, since we're already thinking of loading in from the previous night. Okay, so whoever put that point in the chat, um, good on you. Um, that's a really good point. And it's one of those pieces that um, I was sort of teasing you with, but I didn't share out, but I'm going to have to share out now. Um, Again, we don't know, we have to give our final schedules to headquarters for final approval, but we will be working with our district hero leads and we will not be making decisions without their input. During that time, we will talk about the start, the end of the day, what happens. But one of the other pieces that we feel we can offer more time on task with the robot and, and to provide an advantage to, because there's, there's certain trade-offs for, do I pick Saturday here and a Saturday at another venue? What are the advantages for someone to have Saturday and Sunday at the same place? So you're gonna load in if you want on the night before or first thing in the morning. And if you're playing the second day, we're looking at a, a schedule that would allow those teams that are playing second day to remain in the pits and work on the robot. It's the same. In, in my view, it's the same as the team leaving the venue when the pits close with their robot after day one and going back to their venue school and working on the robot right away, right? So we, we know that one of the pieces of feedback that we've received so far around a single day event is, wow, we're losing hours with our robot. So we're gonna do everything we can to squeeze every hour out of that day to give you as much time with your robot as possible, especially the fact that you're going to be using that robot the next day. And we want to give you ample time to get her ready for the next day, potentially to do whatever changes. And I, I guess that that also brings up other questions such as, um, you know, working with our inspectors or our lead inspector to find out what leniency or leeway might we have or not around, um, you know, what parts are brought in second day versus first day. Because if you're coming in your second day for the event, you would typically bring your spare parts and whatever those rules are this year, which I don't know but we'll look at it that way. Rest assured that every decision will be based upon what is best for the teams and what is consistent and, and equitable across those teams. Excellent, thank you, uh, John. Uh, the next question concerns bonus uh, district ranking points from 2019 and 2020. Will they be applied to teams this year for rookie and second year teams? Well, um, that's a really good question, which we haven't looked at. Um, I'm going to make a note. I have my get back to you list here. Um, now, we know that there is some, Frank has put a blog out of, about that, um, especially when you look at rookies. Those that were rookies in last year, are they rookies again this year versus two years ago? And the rookies never got to participate again since two years ago and so on. So, um, I will make a note of that and I will for sure, um, we're gonna do another session like this next week to make sure that you're as up to date as possible before you make your second picks. And I guarantee I'll have an answer for you then, or we will send out um, maybe an update through this same distribution list uh, so that you get that information sooner. Um, hope I might have that information for you later tonight or tomorrow. Oh, thank you. And we have the next uh, question about how many practice or qualification matches should teams expect? So if you do math, the math, um, we figure, and we're going to go on the, the, the slightly more, um, the larger end of rotations for our matches. So um, 
and we haven't decided this yet, right? So we have to decide what's the turn going to be eight minutes per cycle or is it going to be 10 minutes? Is 10 minutes too much or not enough? The team, there's going to be scenarios where teams play back to back matches. It's just the way the schedule is going to work with 18. So we want to give as much time as possible uh, to those teams. So we're going to try to um, build in as much time as possible. As far as practice matches go, yes, we are thinking that there will be a segment in the morning. And again, this still has to be um, reviewed with our district key role leads. However, um, the intent is to have uh, a period of practice matches in the morning directly uh, prior to the um, or, or post driver's meeting. So that driver's meeting is going to be right off the hop. Doors open, say, and within 15 minutes, it's a driver's meeting. And we're going to talk about that and we're going to go right into, um, well, sorry, there'll be a bit of time, obviously, because teams are loading in in the morning. But the idea is simply, as far as numbers go, uh, 30 minutes would allow us a full rotation of all the teams to have um, participated in practice match. Can we squeeze in two practice matches? We don't know, but would you rather have more qualification rounds or more practice matches? And that's a trade-off that we're going to have to uh, get a clear-cut answer from our FTAs on what's the best scenario um, in terms of getting teams ready so that we have uh, as small amount of um, slowdowns as possible at the beginning of the day. Keep in mind that with these one-day events, um, we we've got to build in measures so we're not waiting two hours to get started because we had some faulty issue because that would be a disaster, right? And in, in the scenario of a one day event, but we'll obviously, we've got the right people to work through all these problems and we'll do our best. All right, so we have now a general question for everyone and we're looking for, of the people here, which school boards have given the full approval to compete? We'd like to know that as well as, Sometimes I speak to teachers in the same board and I get different stories on the same day. Interesting. Um, so even if I was to say what I know, it could change tomorrow. So I don't know that there's a point in saying it. What I will say to you is I've had a couple of mentors reach out to me and say, I'm meeting with my administration and I don't know what to say to them. How can I get them to... And one of the, the questions that was tied to that with the mentor was... Um, could you tell me um, what all the other school boards are doing that are allowing their teams to participate? And I, I didn't have a specific answer because I honestly don't know exactly. What I do know, there are more boards that are more or are in a better position right now to state that, yes, it's fine, it's okay to participate. But then there's the other extreme. There's a, a particular school board that has said, um, you can do whatever you want to the teams. So again, the, the, the spec, spectrum of the gap is very, very uh, large. So hopefully it's going in the right direction given that full capacity was given to very large venues in Ontario recently. And I think that ties into the next question about the capacity limits. And well, we really hope that they won't still apply in the spring, but if they do, can we use some of our capacity to bring in a sponsor and uh, well, we really um, hope you don't have to come to that, but uh, John. That's, that's uh, again, in interesting and intriguing because um, as you all know, our first community is very intelligent and they'll come up with ways to do whatever they need to do. If you're given 30, let's just pick a number, 30 um, representatives can come in. Go back to the days of the Crescent School event. You will be given 30 wristbands. So you can allocate those wristbands to wherever you want. And um, that's not final yet, but that's just a way of trying to manage the COVID piece, right? Because what we don't want is accidentally um, four people are running into the pits and when you get stopped and you say, hey, where are you going? Oh, we're, we're the shift change for the people in the pits and we're gonna come out. We can't have more people in, the, in there. And we know that your GP is gonna make sure that doesn't happen, but for sure, you're not going to be able to go there unless you you have that um, you check with your stand or something like that. So we we really have thought this through to the nth degree. However, I'm sure there's lots of stuff we missed, and please either put in the chat or email myself or William 
uh, any ideas that you have. We're, we're wide open to suggestions and we'd be happy to, if you come up with an idea we haven't thought of, for sure, we're gonna implement it if it's better for teams. So thank you. We're now down to a, another question about the district points system. And I have a feeling we haven't fully uh, reconciled the point system and our one day events yet, unless you have anything else to say about that, John, and that might go to our uh, get back to you later list. Yeah, um, for sure. I can't give you a clear answer on that, um, but I guess I could say um, we're working on it. And uh, again, we're working on it because we, we don't settle for um, anything that's less than what's best for the team. So we're going to be able to, that, that's in that gray area, kind of like, a, um, you know, the, the big void between the two cliffs kind of thing where we think we know what we want to do, but we just haven't got approval for that yet. And when you're looking at what your needs are and where you're picking for your events, um, the current situation as it stands right now to be totally transparent is if you are specifically counting points for qualifications for district champs, you might be of the mindset that, okay, if I win um, the quality award at weekend number one Saturday, I probably have a good chance of winning that award at another event. So maybe I'm going to travel to another event and hopefully win that award. And then you've got your say 10 points. But if you go back to back days at a particular event, you can't win the same award twice because there's one award for the two days. So that's the one piece to be very, very clear about at this point in time. We're looking to see if there's some way we could modify that a little bit much like the question earlier about carrying points forward from last year. So that I'll have to get back to you on. So that actually answered another question that's in the feed here. So that's great. Uh, there are two questions that concern boards not enabling teams to compete yet. And one of those questions was connected with signing up for events tomorrow. And as it was said in the chat here, uh, if you do sign up for an event, it's very easy to get out. But if you don't sign up, for events, then it's quite difficult to get into an event, especially if it's full. So it is wise. You have quite some time to pull out for all the way to January 8th um, if you want to pull out of the uh, events this year. And hopefully by January 8th, we'll have a much clearer uh, understanding of the direction we're heading for March and April. So, yeah, so thank you, William. That, that, that's a, quite a good response. Um, just to add to that a little bit, um, we know that situation exists out there. We know that you might want to pick an event, but your admin has not given you approval yet. So what are you supposed to do? So that's the other good piece about this model is we believe this builds in capacity for an abundance of spots at our events. And what I mean is, um, I know that might be hard to believe when you look at, oh, come on, John, Durham typically is sold out right away and it's got like 40, you know, we used to have 40 plus teams at that event. How can you say that there's going to be spots available? Well, as we go forward, the number, we really have 18 events, 18 single day events. So we have 18 times 18. When you do the math, we have to have over 160 teams register, which means equal to 2019, where we had 166. And even then it would be just enough spots for people. But there is, we, we have built in some measures to try to help if that situation arises. And um, I really can't say much more than that, but that is definitely on the radar. And we will be looking to um, serve your needs, even if you know something happens and you can't make a decision until three weeks. I'm not, by far, the best thing to do is to get into an event. By far, it's way easier to get in and get out, as William said, than to sit and wait and then try to get in later. Um, secure your spot if possible. Um, in theory, you don't need, well, I don't really shouldn't say that. I was gonna say, do you need permission to actually secure a spot? Um, it's, it's always about the permission to actually go to wherever that spot is, right? That's where the permission lies. 
The uh, next question is about the provincials. And I heard some chatter about that today. So I will say, um, I just put my list in for awards today for provincials, for two fields, for the traditional number of teams that we typically have out for provincial championships. So the question in your mind is probably, well, how can you do that when we're dropping everything to 18 teams? So we're cutting it by 50%. Provincial championships is a very large space. The capacity there is huge. They have 5,000 seats there. So the capacity is more than 5,000. So when you think about it, we actually could run with even more teams at the provincial champs, even at a 50% capacity due to COVID. We would make some changes from usual because for sure, we're telling you that we're gonna make our events safe and we're gonna to stick to that. So for sure, we will restructure how we set up our pits to create more space between pits. In all of the venues, by the way, um, we're gonna again appeal to your GP, but the intent would be to have your, your pit space, extra space, and then pit, extra space, pit. And so that we're building in that capacity of spacing and distancing as much as possible through the whole venue. Um, but again, back to champs, think of district champs almost as normal, pretty much normal. That's how we're planning it right at this point in time. I conferred with headquarters, yes, two fields. And even if for some reason we had less teams at district champs, we're still looking at running two fields and so on because we have such a tight timeline to turn all those matches around. However, keep in mind, just like the events, we haven't gone through the final details and worked through the collaboration with the district hero leads. And that's going to happen. And after those discussions, that's when you will know exactly what the numbers are. But we're planning for normal district champs numbers. Well, that's a really nice thing to hear. Using the word normal is a very good thing. And, and in um, person. <laughs> yes. Um, the question about the deadline to get out of an event, currently it's January 8th. That's the pick up your kit of parts and robot base day. If you pick up your kit of parts uh, on the kickoff day, that's an indication that you are committing to uh, compete financially. And if not, then the full refund is available if you have not picked up your kit of parts. So January 8th. So we have some time uh, yet to, uh, get a full refund on the fees. Um, then- William, William, just on that point, I just want to add that as, um, however that's being received by you, the message about January the 8th, um, keep this in mind that typically it was roughly the end of November. And um, then we would order a kit shipment coming up to Canada. When that kit shipment comes to Canada, um, that was the drop dead piece, right? Uh, in 99.99% of the situations. I mean, of course, we're always gonna to try to mitigate on your behalf and to support um, something that's terrible that happens. But um, the standard baseline is January 8th. So if you were a team that said, aha, I'm gonna wait though until January 20th to ask for my kit. The, we don't know what's gonna happen with those kits on January the 8th at the end of the day, but there will be a plan built to send those kits back to the United States. Because for sure, um, we have never been in a position where, uh, and I'll give you an example, just a single team. If one team has not shown up you know, at the kickoff, we phone them and they say, yeah, we're out. We have to, then we immediately send the kit back to headquarters. We, we never hold on to a kit. Um, or we hold it for inventory for a couple of days in case your kit was missing a part. We take the kit piece out of that kit and make sure you've got what you want before you send it back to headquarters. That said, another key point that's worth mentioning now is um, we strongly encourage you to not do my site kit shipment. Uh, it's very important that Ontario has the ability to control the entry of those kits into Canada. We have a proven process. That is also the same process we use for the robots going to worlds and coming back from worlds. Uh, if you think back to the last three years, that's been, in, in my opinion, a much, much smoother process for everybody involved. Um, and that's what we're planning to do this year. As soon as you go to my site, so of course, you know, I can't, I can't go 
people and cut your hand off because you you picked my site. However, in reality, when you when you do that, it's a hundred percent up to you now. If that kid gets held up at the border, we can't help you. So thank you, John. I just wanted to take a opportunity to um, remind uh, friends here of our Monday night coding session. The coding sessions will be starting on Monday evening on this same Zoom call. And if any teams have any expertise to share, we'd be most happy to put you into the schedule. We're really trying to create a community of support throughout the province so that every team feels they have enough knowledge to move forward on the coding piece. And uh, the first of our series of coding sessions from now till the mid-December will start on Monday. And then uh, they will continue on into the build season at the end of February. So just a little invitation if you feel your team needs coding or if your team has something to share about beginner or intermediate or later after the build season starts, more advanced coding. Um, the next question, um, what if a team wants to have 20 new uh, participants on the second day of a two day weekend on the same venue and I would guess there since they're separate events you can have separate team rosters I guess there's going to be separate uh, arm uh, bands or wristbands and uh, so that'll give you some flexibility especially for those large teams who want to give everyone a chance to participate will the first two events be qualifiers for provincials for example if you do week one back to back will that be it for qualifying it absolutely will. Yeah. Um, really good question again. Um, so depending on the season, when you look at all the events that are listed there, and again, uh, take Western off, that's not on the books. That's not a choice for you. Um, Paul, could, could you email right now? Could you do that for me while we're talking? Um, just email Lori and ask her to remove Western. Yep. And that way it's done right away. Um, so uh, yes, you take your points and you get to go once you've done two days. So even if you did the first Saturday and the last Sunday in the whole season, you won't know if you're going to district champs until the end of the second event, right? Just like we do when we do McMaster or when we do Western University. Um, I will say though, we also believe because this model builds in capacity, additional spots, as I've said to you, it kind of buffer room is the term I was looking for. Um, there likely will be opportunities for third place. Because our goal, again, we would want to fill everything up to give you as much playing time as possible. So that third play opportunity will be there. But as you know, chronologically, your first two events that are selected are the ones that um, you draw your points from. William is muted. muted. Thank you, John. Uh, we have a question about opening up our events in Ontario to teams from outside of Ontario, as that's always an exciting element of our uh, weekends at the FRC events. So let me give you uh, insight into how that happens with that process that occurs. So we do round one of the event selection, which is tomorrow, then we do round two. And after round two, there's that period of time, typically we'd have a couple of weeks where um, teams from, they would go to third, uh, third event options and fourth and fifth. So you could pick as many other ones as you want. And you would pick those events and go on wait list. You would not get into the event unless written approval is sent by us back to headquarters to allow the team into the event. So, there is no way anybody's getting an Ontario spot if a, an Ontario team doesn't have that spot. So it's it's that simple. We we really do enjoy you know the our good friends that come to our events from outside of Ontario. However, um, that's just not going to. I mean, you know, if it's you know the middle of November and we have ten spots waiting, would we allow that to happen? Probably, but we're going to give the options to Ontario teams first um, to be able to get those third place and uh, eat up those spots. So then the next question concerns our one day versus two day events in terms of the finances and what we're getting out of the events. And uh, so what are the features of the one day event 
uh, that make up for what we did in the two day events, John. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, a really uh, important question um, and very tough one for us because um, we're, we're kind of like a pass through, right? You, you pay your money um, to us, but we, we do that to um, eliminate you having to do the UX exchange and go for, ask for a certified check and all those things that, you know, are hard for your school budget secretaries to do and so on. So we grab, you, you make your payments, we suck it up if the exchange fee is worse than you know what you gave us. And then we make a lump sum PO to headquarters. So those rules that headquarters makes around vouchers and what happens after this state of you know the thing is canceled and it's beyond your control, we cannot control that. We absolutely cannot control that. Um, so we've looked at and we had discussions about what could we do about costs? Is there any way we can change the costs? The only way we could change the costs is if we convinced headquarters to give you a $2,000 voucher instead of a $1,000 voucher. So that's where we're, we're at at this given point in time. So uh, that's definitely uh, something we're working through. And even so, we're not cutting in half the number of uh, matches. Uh, we actually are sticking more matches into the schedule by carefully man managing the schedule. And yeah, several features have been added to our events to maximize the experience. Uh, we have a, a question about boards that do not permit the collection of student vaccination status. And I want to say thank you to Lisa as I didn't get to answer back her email. And she sent a lot of strategies that can be used to help uh, FRC teams offer full participation regardless as to whether it's in-person or remote. And we've already heard about remote scudding in our discussion this evening. The, uh, I suppose there are a number of ways that we can offer for students to participate remotely during an event, uh, during the season. And therefore you may present to your board that the students may choose to participate remotely or in person, knowing full well that if they show up to an event, they will be asked by the event venue to produce their vaccination status. The board will not be asking for that. Uh, further comments, I'm sure John may have a few. Sure. Um, thanks for that, uh, William. Um, Lisa, please chime in if you want to with any information you might have from our, the acronym everyone is CTF, COVID Task Force. Lisa is one of the um, important members on that committee. But what I would add to that um, is that um, privacy is gonna be protected uh, of anyone who participates. You will know anybody that's in that building is safe to be there. So we have our protocols in place. We have privacy measures in there to protect those people. Um, on Nobody's gonna say, oh, that person is here because they've got two COVID shots and that person um, is here because they have a medical buy and that person, none of that's gonna happen. It's gonna be, all teams will be vetted as they come through the door um, and the privacy piece will be upheld and it will be permissible according to what the local public health is. And of course, the venue. So we have to manage the venue piece too, whatever their protocols are at that point in time. Lisa, do you have yeah. anything? Uh, so, I think I know what you're asking, Jamie, um, just as uh, to go on the event side, like how we're going to deal with screening people. Like our goal is to our I, the idea is that we would use the tool that the province is going to release. Of course, we don't know what that tool looks like right now, but we're going to work on work on that. So essentially, we would not we would not be saving any of that data. Um, the person um, bringing the students like the mentor would not have to collect that data beforehand. I think what you're asking is like um, how if the teachers aren't allowed to know whether or not their students or like ask the students whether or not they're vaccinated or not. Um, we've had some people ask us this question and one suggestion that we have, and of course this is not foolproof, um, but maybe the the, te the teachers themselves who are taking or like the adults who are responsible, the mentors who are responsible for taking the students to the event could contact the parents and say to the parents that if you're because uh, typically like for schools, you have permission forms and stuff like that, right? So it's like to the parent, your child, there's a requirement of the venue that your child is 
completely vaccinated. And then it's on the parents to like whether or not they're gonna, because if you can't collect that information, it's like on the parents whether or not they're gonna fill out that form and like let their kid go to that event. And at the event, they would have to show proof. Um, the flip side of that is like, what hap What do you do as a team lead, as, a, as an adult on that team, if a student then cannot participate at that point? And that I do not have a good answer for you. Um, the closest thing I can come up with is like, sometimes when, when we go to the border and cross the border to go to Champs, we have contingency plans that if someone, if a student can't cross, there's an adult that can take them back, something like that. Um, but that's what I have for you. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. I, again, just to be very clear with everybody, um, we don't have all the wrinkles ironed out or the details finalized, but we're getting close and we are definitely going to let you know um, what exactly we're going to do in regard to what was just asked. The other piece, though, that was in that question is um, if a board has a certain policy, how are we going to be able to um, work with the policy of that school board that would then allow those kids to participate or what have you, regardless of what the situation is. So we are looking at all of those different scenarios and we will have solutions available uh, for you to hear in detail um, going forward. That's not a, a couple or response, everyone. I just want you to know that's exactly where we're at with things. And um, our CTF is building this long list of key pieces and we're updating it each time we solve one. So it's, um, you'll see that on that message that went out last week with the message about the 18 team events, it's posted on our website. You'll be able to go in there and see some of those key pieces, but those are being um, detailed even further going forward. So we, we will get back to you with them, um, the full details on that. So uh, there was a question about eating food at events. I suppose it may uh, still be, you probably are not allowed to have food in the pits. I remember that is quite a rule. Um, but the, uh, I don't know if there are any additional details about this. So uh, we know that that is one of our, that is a question that we know everyone's gonna be thinking about. We have not solidified uh, policy or procedure for that. Like William said, like no food in the pits like usual, but um, the pro we want to make sure that there's a safe environment for students, like for all participants to eat because it's a, it is a long day. Um, and like John said, when we figure out the best way to do that, we will, we will be communicating that. Yeah. And think about it this way, the, like the pendulum. So which way the pendulum is sitting. So right now, um, if things get a little bit worse COVID wise, then the restrictions would be increased. And the restrictions could look like um, absolute minimum entry exits of the facility. So you, you would know in a, well in advance, you would know through team communications, you would know by our communications. When I say team communications, I mean, um, when you sign up for McMaster, you typically would get two or three team communications from McMaster about the event. You would have all those exact details in there well before you go to the event. That said, um, you know, if everybody meets the criteria around the vaccination uh, policy, um, whether you go in or out may not be an issue by the time we get to the event. But again, if things do get a little bit worse, then those restrictions will be tightened up. And we will say to you, please plan accordingly. Um, does that mean you would be allowed to bring more food in? Um, of course. So we'll, we'll look at all of those uh, pieces that um, are connected with that. Good question, though. I've got it written down, and we'll make sure um, that Lisa's got that on the agenda with the task force. So there were a number of uh, questions about the vaccination. And uh, the first has its policy about vaccination, but also sort of the event venues. And I think that has been addressed in the discussion uh, so far in the chat. and. Uh, verbally. We also have a question about playing uh, two events in one weekend. Does that mean two chairman's interviews in one weekend? So you mean uh, Saturday I go to Humber and on Sunday I go to Waterloo, something like that, I guess, right? Uh, absolutely. Or actually that one was for one venue. If you're all day in North or all weekend in North Bay, does that mean two chairman's interviews or one? One. You can only win. Keep in mind, at a particular event, 
you could only there's only going to be one chairman's corner. Great. So okay. that's spread over the two days. So we still have to um, decide on that hybrid model, what that looks like. Uh, if in fact we can do that, um, we think we're going to do that. Um, but some awards will be in-person judging and some awards will not be in-person judging or be virtual. And again, the goal with that, if you think about it again, the metric or the, the pendulum is how can we give teams as much time to focus on your team experience competing at that event without taking away from the experience of engaging with judges for awards. So would it be smart to say, um, and again, I don't know the answer to this, but look at this piece. So we're in the pits. I need to build my robot or get the robots pieces together. I only have one day of uh, robot competition access to my robot. And am I gonna have three chairman's people standing in the pits while that chaos is happening? So those are the types of things we're looking at that if we put our, our team hat on, what can we do to try to mitigate that? If there is chairman's at the event, in-person judging, what would work best for the teams so that we don't cause an issue that causes you to be panicked while you're in your pits working on your robots. So um, can parents bring students to the event and how does that work? And I suppose that may depend on your school board and your team and Lisa has her hand up there. So like William said, it'll depend on what's allowed by your school board and your team. Um, but also I think you're asking like in relation to like our check-in, like what type of screening and check-in we're gonna be doing. Um, again, we have not finalized our screening and check-in process, but the idea, uh, one idea that um, we have right now is that like we're, we may ask teams to like come to the check-in area as one, which would mean like, yes, the parent could drop them off in the parking lot to their team and then they would enter as a team. Again, that is not finalized. And again, you will know all of these protocols um, through your communications with uh, with your event coordinator. Yeah, just to uh, add to that, and Lisa, I'm, I'm, uh, I like the way that you stick handle that. Um, there's the piece around um, that we haven't solved yet that we know is going to be the biggest log gem at the tournament is going to be check in. When you come to check in, we have to make sure that the people that are there, the ones you said are coming to the event. The CNRs are in place. Um, all of those pieces, the consents match the, the, the vaccinations and so on. So all those pieces will be looked at. You'll be allowed in. You'll be given your wristbands. If people, the more coming and going that goes on, the harder it's going to be for us to ensure the protected environment for everybody. So keep in mind, that's the most important piece. Although every individual is important at this event, um, the, the impact on everyone is the greater importance. So we have to make sure that the environment is safe, no matter what. And as Lisa said, we will give you clear cut decisions on all of these um, questions. These are great questions, um, but there may be, um, like here's an example. There's a good question in the chat there about, um, will you have to wear masks? Well, what do you have to do right now when you go outside to any uh, indoor activity of any kind, the grocery store or whatever, you have to wear a mask. So our current position is, yes, you have to wear a mask. Will that go away for the event? We don't know yet, but currently it's you're wearing a mask, 100% people, 100% of the time. My so, friend just noted well, that at the Leafs game, they're optional tonight, so you never know. Well, you never know. What I'm just thinking uh, what it's going to look like to have the MCs with a mask on while well, they're saying their thing. So anyway, really good questions. Here we are. Which medical professionals are part of the CTF task force? The medical consultations and advice is going to be going through the public health and whatever the policy is at a particular venue. So if public health says you could have 75% capacity, or let's go with the Leafs game, unlimited, like 100% capacity, but the venue says 80%, then it's going to be 80%. So we don't overrule either of those two um, governing bodies. 
The uh, next question is about if we can only attend Durham, well, will, ah, oh, that will limit the team to awards that could possibly win if only one set of awards over two days. Why can't each day be treated as a complete different day and all awards are up for grabs? And that's an interesting, complex international issue. I think that's part of it. Uh, some things are dictated by headquarters and not all jurisdictions are going for these one day events. And there is a lot of complexity around that as this is, yeah. yeah. Well, um, again, I, I can't stress enough about how good these questions are. Um, we sincerely want you to know our position, First Canada is 100%. That's the number one issue we have. Number one, we want it to be a single set of awards for each single day. That is not the position of headquarters and how they are trying to balance the two day events that exist out there. This, the few single day events, there's only three regions currently with uh, single day events. We are one of those three. And the, the feedback that we get is um, it devalues the award. So a chairman's winner out of 18 teams and a chairman's winner out of 18 on the next day. Um, that's a hard pill to swallow in, in my mind. Um, I want to celebrate success of our teams as much as possible, especially in a year like this. However, that is what the current situation is. And I underline the word current um, with headquarters. Um, if I'm a team that is looking for, if I'm not restricted on um, travel, I would probably look to do one day at one venue and one day at another, because I can hopefully double my points on wins. Obviously you can't double your chairman's points. However, on those other judge, judged awards, you can. If you are um, constrained by travel, it makes a lot of sense to try to do the two day events, like uh, at one venue and go with that route. And um, we'll, we'll see uh, if anything happens down the road. I can be, uh, again, to be totally transparent with you, right now, we don't, we're not 100% sure that we can do a hybrid model of judging, but we're definitely pushing for that. So if it's not a hybrid, then the current model would be uh, remote, 100% remote. And now we're down to an interesting question. Uh, I've forgotten if York and Durham are on the same weekend but it says here, can we win two of the same award? Well, you can, um, depends what, again, if you go to uh, York on Saturday and Waterloo on Sunday, you could win the quality award twice, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, keep in mind, week five has three events for the first time ever in Ontario. So there's a, if you're not sure, but you wanna compete at you know, within the time frame of a weekend, there's a lot of choice in those three events. But again, capacity is still 18. Doesn't matter that the venue is bigger, it's 18 teams. And we're not deviating from the 18, no matter what pressures we feel. Um, so the final question uh, at the moment, or not the final one, it's just the, the most recent one rather, is most of FRC has two day events, but in Ontario, it's only one event. In Chesapeake Bay, it's single events like us. In Montreal, they're turning the regional into a single day event. And in Ontario, it's a single day event. And headquarters has left the gate open if other venues across the world would like to move to one day events. So in essence, uh, we are a bit of a um, front runner in terms of um, making changes that we feel are gonna be the best for the community at large. And um, let me walk you through a scenario um, that gives you more insight into how we arrived at where we're at. So if you take those 18 single day events and cut them in half to make two day events, you have nine events. Nine events, we don't know how many teams are gonna register, but we for sure won't have enough spots for teams to participate. So we'd be in a position to say, I'm sorry, you didn't register or the last four teams on a wait list, you just can't participate this year. 
So for sure, we didn't want to do that. Um, we didn't want to have that situation. We want to be able to control what we're able to, to, able to do for the community. And the best way to do that is to guarantee that we've got enough spots for everyone. And we have flexibility within those spots to mitigate any problem that arises. So that, that's the flip side of it. Um, and the other piece, think of it this way. If you reduce those events into two-day events, you've got now 36 teams per event, right? How's that working for COVID? When you have um, 36 teams at a venue that is so tight and small, it can't happen. So we would right away be able to have to tell teams, um, so many teams can't attend this event, even though it's a two-day event. So we'd have to do, for example, um, a two-day event for 15 or 18 or 20 teams, and that's it. And we still wouldn't have enough spots. So the lower we go with the numbers, the less spots there are available for teams. So every team that there is in the province, we have to have two spots available to compete. So that, that gives you the math factor on how we calculate our events. And it also tells you why, how we are so pushy about trying to get people to register as early as possible so we can count how many events we need. We've had, um, so let's, let's again look at Western drop, um, McMaster dropped, um, Carlton dropped, and um, there, there could be others that drop. Fortunately, we have the capacity built in to absorb if something happens like that. So uh, now looking on into the future, will it always be in this format, the one day event, or is this a temporary measure brought on by current conditions? 100% there's no plan, um, behind the scenes plan that we're secretly uh, giving birth to the future of how we're gonna do FRC in Ontario. For sure, uh, it's gonna go back to two day events, for sure. Um, and then as a continuing of that statement or a extension of that statement for this season, <laughs> uh, is there any scenario where we would revert to two day events if the current COVID conditions improve? In, in this season, no. Yeah. What you'll have in front of you is what is going to be available. Yeah. Um, the only change that I could see happening at all would be um, 170 teams registered and we have to have, we have to find more spots for people to play. We can so, look at the math on that, right? So we have 18 teams, which you've heard me talk about for over an hour, why 18 teams were good. If we tried to go to 24 teams at an event in our current structure, we would not only kill all the volunteers, but the day would just be so horrendously long for everybody involved. And for sure, nobody would be picking back-to-back -back days because you're not going to last for two 16-hour days in a row with your team, nor would you want to do that. So um, the only change that could possibly happen would be us trying to find more spots available for teams to play. And that's, that's about it. This is uh, perhaps the best way to guarantee the greatest opportunity in a very highly volatile environment where the conditions change continuously. Yeah, we, so, we tr you're right, William. Like, we truly do believe that um, we've got enough buffer room on either side to handle whatever gets thrown at us going forward. Um, and with the current plan, the current model that we've just stated is it's going to stay like this. It's not going to get... Um, we're not going to revert to two-day events. All The only other changes that will happen, which will be good, is that we will improve upon what we're making available to you within the single-day model. Uh, good question about um, repercussions. Um, if somebody shows up, um, whether they're not COVID-vaxxed um, and no... They don't have the proper um, passing for uh, COVID or you show up inebriated or whatever. Um, we would just follow normal standard procedures and have them removed from the premises. Um, we, we can't say to you right now, this is exactly what we're gonna do, but that is one of those key items that has already been mentioned in our meetings, but we'll be going deeper with that, of course, to make sure that we know and you know that um, it would be very, very tough for anybody to um, get into the facility if they're not clear. 
So at the moment, we don't have any additional questions in the queue. I hope we haven't missed any. It's quite possible we may have. There are a number of questions. Um, William, I would like to ask uh, the, the attendees that um, if there's anything anyone wants to share with us about what your current situation is with your um, ability to acquire permission to register um, or not, um, are you sitting on the fence and why are you? And um, no judgment on anybody. It's more, the more information we get, the better that we can um, handle these situations. I'm waiting for that chat box to light up like crazy, everyone. Come on. Oh, um, and while you're thinking about those questions you're gonna ponder, um, very excited to tell you that uh, uh, this year, um, when you look at your teams, it's not what I'm excited about, but when you look at your teams and you realize, oh my goodness, we've gone through almost two full seasons of no experience. Like we don't have the rigid competition experience with our team members. What are we supposed to do? Who do I have? I have grade nines and grade 11s that have, sorry, not the grade nines. Maybe I have grade, some grade 11s and grade 12s that have some experience and nothing else. What do I do? Um, so Paul, William and I have been working on um, an enhanced program to support the every bot. Now, Keep in mind, the idea behind this is to bring an, a solution to our teams as quick as possible with, uh, I don't wanna say less effort, but um, one that's gonna give you a robot that's gonna be functional. And you're gonna hear a lot more details about that over the next month or so, but basically we're gonna have various venues that are gonna host this, um, every bot and it's gonna be roughly the third week of the build. And there's reason, a lot of reason for that. You'll see that in the correspondence that comes out. But those first three weeks would give teams that aren't sure what they're doing a lot of time to plan to get all their uh, resources together and to come to that every bot weekend and come up with a robot. And there are people that are on this call that uh, in 2019 or 18, uh, won their event the first place with their every bot. So as you know, um, your robot doesn't have to be the best looking, doesn't have to be the perfect robot, but it's gotta be consistent when it's out there. So I just thought I'd put that out there for you. You're gonna hear more from us on that. And we're putting a lot of effort in. This year, uh, the uh, robot uh, kit pickup at Studica is gonna be just like before. It's just a quick pickup, drive through almost, pick up your kit and see you later. However, um, other venues are still doing the kickoff and quick build. So it'll be up to them what they do with their quick builds, but we will share with them what we're doing with the every bot so that hopefully um, they could try to help steer people in the same way. Uh, there was a question about um, schools communicating within a board because uh, sometimes one school has found out they're allowed to compete while others haven't. And I've seen evidence of that talking to people from the same board in the same day. Yeah, I, I see that a lot in any year. And I would just say to whoever that person is, um, I'm going <laughs> to, I want to challenge you to set up a group, a Slack group or a discussion group, uh, Discord with the, the group of all the people that are in your school board. There is power in numbers. And I, I'll tell you what, when we talk to a school board, so example, last week, we went, had talked to one of the larger school boards. The first thing we did was we gathered our data on how many teams are in first in your school board. And then we start talking because that says a lot to the school board. So that's one piece. The other piece, and so you're gonna get central support. The other piece is that the collaboration that can go on that is, um, it's so valuable. And if, keep in mind this too. So you're in a particular school board, school board A, um, my teacher can't be involved for some reason, but the permissions are neutral within all the schools in the school board. So your team could come over to school, another school in the board and do work with the robot. And you don't have to go through that permission process, right? So because you're under the same umbrella of the school boards, that's a hugely important piece. And we used to, I used to spend a lot of time making sure that all the schools in my board 
um, were connected. So there was, I think at one time, 10 or 11 in my board, but look at TDSB at one time had 25 teams in FRC competing. So of course you guys should be uh, creating a group and communicating that way. So a uh, good, good point for somebody to bring up, but again, I challenge you to be the one who spearheads the, uh, setting that group up. And I would be happy to meet with your group at any time and share ways that um, I have learned on how to get through to the, the root pot of money in the school boards and so on. So that would be, I'm sure, very helpful for you, but it's true. There are a lot of um, different ways that boards operate, but the pots of money are there and um, how, how to access that, especially when you come from a group of all the people in the school board. Kickoff is happening in person is a, a comment that I see in the chat box. Um, currently, it's going to depend on the kickoff location. I know that one kickoff location is still doing the kickoff. The only way they could get permission was to say the teams are just going to come, pick their stuff up, and leave. So that is how they got past the permission piece. Hopefully, in their minds, things are going to improve, and they'll be able to host it in actual quick build. The other piece too, I would offer you, if anybody is um, struggling with um, administration and um, it, it would be helpful, I would, I would be pleased to join a call with your admin, um, phone call, Zoom call, whatever you want uh, to try to help communicate what we're doing so that they hear it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. And that might alleviate some of the, or minimize some of the hurdles that could happen out there. Okay. Well, we don't want to hold y'all hostage, and I'm happy to sit here for another two hours and just chat um, and hear any recommendations that you have. If um, there are some things that you wanted to communicate that you didn't feel you had a chance to for some reason, please email us, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. I did make a list here about, um, well, making sure Western is dropped, so hopefully that's taken care of from Paul and headquarters. Um, I will look into the um, specifics around the points to be carried forward from last year for teams for this year and that going towards the championships. And I can't see that changing. In a normal year, those points carrying over should be the same. Um, we'll look at more details on the screening policy um, and how that is, uh, how it responds or reflects according to the different school boards that have various policies out there. And then the other piece, CTF will look at the food piece too in more detail going forward. And um, again, uh, thanks Paul for that. Um, the recording will be available for anybody. Um, Paul, where, did, where does one go to get the recording? Uh, well, I, uh, uh, sorry, well, go ahead. Oh, it's being recorded from this Zoom account here and we'll figure out how to get it posted up on the same links probably on Google Drive, and then it'll, a link will be sent out somehow. Paul, does it get posted in our YouTube at all or no? Uh, we could do that. I don't, I, don't, okay. I don't, if you're okay with it, that might be easier for everybody. Mm -hmm. we don't have to or, or both, because I, I think we're going to be um, sending out another uh, communication out to this group and everybody else that's on that list. We're not going to exclude anyone um, of all those teams that are registered so, so that we can give you more details about the questions that were asked tonight that we didn't give you full answers to and inform you of anything new that develops. Um, we really are working on a lot of key issues that um, if changes happen would be improved for you and we will definitely let you know as soon as we know what those situations are. And again, um, it's gonna be crazy for the next 10 days for you for registering. Uh, what I would say to you is don't hesitate to contact us if you're having any trouble. Um, Paul, William, and I are dividing up the duties, just so as an FYI for everyone. If you go to register and you can't, email Paul or William. If you have a problem with wait lists and those types of things, email me. So I'm going to stick handle those pieces, and those guys are going to stick handle the others because there's probably going to be a lot of them. 
And uh, even though people feel that you're fully ready to register, something always goes wrong and uh, people just can't register. But fortunately, you have seven days. Sounds like a salesperson and you have seven days to decide. <laughs> Um, okay. Any any great stories, anyone? Um, seems like we, it's been so long since we've seen you all. I, I don't want to say goodbye already. I, I want to um, give a shout out to somebody and center that person out a little bit in a positive way. Um, we have April, who has apparently joined us here in Ontario as one of our um, key FTA persons, people. And um, April, I'm not sure, there must be a lot of other things that um, you do that would be super beneficial to an event. So let's just say, you know, we had like five FTAs at one event and you weren't one of them. What else would you do at that event besides try to help those FTAs? Oh, uh, what else did I do at that event? Um, well, I'm a lead mentor for a team in Ontario now, which is awesome. Um, so I might be with them. Um, otherwise, like, I think it's really great to get to talk to teams. Um, so like team interviews, judging is really fun. Um, you really get to get into like the nitty gritty of the robots um, with the students. And that's that's really kind of the best part of first for me. So is getting to hear what the students have done. Um, I think it's gonna be particularly interesting this year um, because yeah. students are so out of practice kind of as, as you alluded oh to, and we're certainly seeing that on our team. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see kind of how younger students get into it, how older students kind of get back into it. Um, uh, yeah, so judging is a good one. Um, CSA, FTA, um, parking lot attendant, safety glasses attendant, all of the roles are very important. <laughs> yes. So kind of whatever needs to be done to run an event, I am happy to do. Yeah, just roll your sleeves up and do whatever's needed. Well, we're so, so thrilled that time when I heard that uh, you were coming to Ontario. Um, seems like we're stealing the good ones. And uh, um, we're really thrilled to have you for sure. And uh, um, I, I know that we have full confidence in you doing any uh, job because just you being there is going to help our events. So it's fantastic. And thank you for speaking oh, up also. Absolutely flattered. Yeah, so, it's nice you to hear from you. So. Welcome. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So uh, everyone, um, you might have seen April at some of the events in the past. She's helped out a lot. But I can, I can say it mostly with um, the purple hair. Mm -hmm. So kind of like um, Lisa, but purple. <laughs> yeah. So again, thanks for sharing that, April. That's fantastic. Um, I'm surprised she's not wearing all that first can of the swag that I know she owns. I do have it. I have an apron. It's in the, it's in the kitchen. Um, oh, I'm just not nice. cooking right now, so it's, it's put away. Nice. But yes, I do have quite a lot of first Canada swag, and everyone in first in Texas was very jealous of my cool first Canada swag. So oh, y'all well, are doing something there, yeah. right up here. Yeah, well, we're looking forward to your expertise too, because I know you uh, you were participating in the Texas off season, off season event, um, so that's mm -hmm. going to help us, of course. And um, the uh, what was I going to say to you? The other piece about oh, I am so excited to see what's going to happen with your team, with uh, the two new leads that are on that team. It's just uh, can't wait. Um, that's all I'll say about it because I, I can't show any favorites to anybody because they're all yeah. my teams. It's, uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be a process. Um, so COVID has uh, affected everyone pretty much across the board. Um, so I think it'll be a, a really true demonstration of kind of like the resilience of first teams to come back from three th almost three years off of this. We're coming back with a handful of grade elevens and twelves, um, and some spunky grade nines, and like that's gonna be it. Um, and so I think it'll really demonstrate the resilience of first teams um, and also hopefully some gracious professionalism and kind of helping others out across the board. So I think this yeah. is going to be a good year. It's going to be a different year, um, but I'm really excited to get back to robots. Nice, nice. Can't wait. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else want to share any uh, common stories? Um, what's going on in your area? Um, I see... Uh, um, the London, some of the teams from London, um, done anything you want to share with us? Did, did you have any success with your school board recently? Not to call on anybody and send it out, but go ahead. Thanks for calling me out, John. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's just good, good to be back. Like TVDSB is allowing us to meet in person with students. And so, you know, our meetings are back. Wow. So that part's exciting. It's, it's nice to be working with the kids again. 
I'm currently talking to like the senior admin of, uh, of the Thames Valley District School Board and hoping that we can get approval for um, competing in person. Um, that's, that's why I asked those questions. I was curious if there is any boards Absolutely. out there that have given approval yet, um, <clears throat> but it's a process, right? We'll keep working at it. I got till January 8th, I hear, to, to get that out, sorted okay. out. So fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah. and you know, if you are having another meeting uh, coming up down the road, a week, two weeks, month, whatever, and you want more ammunition, um, connect with me again um, and say, I need this from you. And I will make sure I put something together for you that would maybe help with your uh, cause. Great, that's great. Thanks, John. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, guys. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone. It's been a really great pleasure to get to meet uh, some friends here from the first community. As some of you are familiar from the previous events and looking forward to meeting the rest of you in person. It's greatly optimistic that we're heading in that direction and uh, hope to support all the teams to get through all the hurdles to be able to compete in person very soon. You know, I, if I could just add, William, um, I'm seeing some of the chat go by and uh, um, congrats to Halton uh, for getting their approval um, for uh, participating. That's fantastic. And I will say to you, because they're also now mentioning about SHSMs, we oh. are doing a lot of work recently with uh, school boards on SHSM and EHS or exploring high skills connections to uh, first, both FRC and FTC. And of course, FTC really hits the mark. And the other, I don't know, Lisa, if we should share the excitement about FTC as far as headquarters, working with us to map the FTC experience to the Ontario curriculum. So how great is that? And the hope is that that will be done through grade seven to 12. We know there's a lot of hurdles that come with that, but that is just so exciting that headquarters is on board for that. I can imagine how excited you are, Lisa, with that piece, eh? That's just uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's like, it's, really awesome that they're like they're going to be working with us um, to provide that because it's going to be a really awesome tool for, um, for teams to use to be able to relate robots to their curriculum and give students a really awesome experience in the classroom. Absolutely. Um, and so when Lisa says um, we're going to be doing, we're already, it's already underway. So it has started just so you know. Yes. And um, Back to the SHSM, um, we did do a pilot last year with the uh, Toronto Catholic Board, one of the schools where we provided one of the certifications for SHSM or SBE, or as you know, uh, ICE, and we gave them a coding challenge and it worked out very well. And we have a, a few of the big school boards now on track that want to sit down and talk about how we can um, spread the first experience through the SHSM program in their schools in EHS. So a lot of great stuff coming down the pipe for everybody from curriculum to curricular connections to making first a part of the in-class experience for the um, kids in our schools. Sure, I'd like to hear what's going doing? on Manitoulin Island, actually, John. Yeah. I'd like to interrupt you there. Oh, well, yeah, I saw that Chris was on there. Chris, um, Chris, you want to chime in? Mr. Mara. Did he just disappear? Maybe he did, but I know Alan's there as well. I'm here, sorry, I'm doing bedtime at the same time. <laughs> oh. What was the question? I missed it. Pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> We're just wondering what's going on on Manitoulin Island. Oh, wrong Chris then. <laughs> oh, wrong Chris, oh, sorry. I did see Chris Mara there a while back, but I know Alan Davies also there as well, so. Hi guys. Yeah. Hey, Alan, how are you doing? How's the island? Oh, it, it's pretty good. Um, okay. We're, yeah, we're still going through the process. We haven't got official word from our board yet. I know right now our basketball teams are only allowed to play Rainbow District School Board schools. They're not allowed to go outside of the health district. Um, but we're hoping that'll change type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be allowed to go to Southern Ontario Probably not, but I don't know. Um, but on an upside, we do have a whole bunch of new grade nines and tens that have no experience, no nothing in terms of first. And uh, so far every week when we've been meeting, we've had great turnout, lots of excitement type of thing. Um, so we are looking forward to it. 
Good stuff. And you've got the background um, from starting a team from scratch. So that'll help you uh, moving forward with the new kids. Think of the yeah, mentors, sure. yeah, that are out there that um, joined a team partway through the team's existence. And then now they have to be in a position to start a new team and what that would be like. And all those, oh my goodness. I remember my second year um, when my right-hand person from year one was gone. And suddenly I had to worry about all those critical deadlines and dates. It was just monstrous. And that fear of knowing if you're going to miss a deadline, right? And uh, then, of course, as you get more experience and you start working towards the uh, higher achieving awards like chairman's and uh, is the essay done is it been proofread a thousand times does it meet the right number of characters does it create the essence of what you want to communicate compared to the essay and then did it get submitted on time all of those pieces yeah so. i guess one of the things uh john is that uh, obviously travel is our biggest expense same with chris Marr and all the northern ontario teams so that's one thing we do have to take into consideration mm -hmm. so i'm gonna have to meet with our other mentors our business people tomorrow because they were looking this year at going after the chairmans. And so because it's only one award per weekend, um, yeah, but we've got lots of decisions we still have to make is what it boils down to. <laughs> and we'll, I'll be yeah. calling you or, or William to kind of get some advice on where we should go. That's that's pretty much it given, I think. No, and for on sure. And, yeah, and, and you know what, That that's the good point for everybody, right? Um, never pull the plug without talking to us. Right? We're, we're always going to do everything we can to help every team that's uh, uh, out there. Yeah, and we're we're so fortunate. We also have, like, we have uh, Chris Mara, we've got Dan Monty from Sudbury, and we've got uh, 1305 we can always call on, too. So it'll be, uh, yeah, it, it's, I'm glad we're doing it. We can go back in person again, because that's what the kids have right. been dying to see. The kids that got the one event experience from a couple of years ago. They're just chomping at the bit to get more experience type of thing. And uh, so, yeah, it's so, we're all so happy just that there's an opportunity to have in-person events type of thing. Mm -hmm. so, Excellent. Thanks, thanks for all the work you guys are doing, you folks at first. Well, uh, we appreciate that. And, you know, it, definitely it's not easy. Uh, it's not easy to try to get out ahead of something that's this massive in terms of shifting to th these one day events. And um, we know that you all know that um, we're not gonna just make a rash decision without a lot of thought being put into it. And um, boy, I, I just think, you know, if we were to say, hey, whatever, let's just go with what we've got and run the two day events and then things get a little bit worse. And then uh, teams do finally wanna register at the last minute and there's not enough spots. And it's just an unworkable, formula to operate that way so we had to be proactive and do what we can and the one thing we can assure you is the experience is going to be very rewarding no matter what yeah and, and we, we totally appreciate the fact mm -hmm. that no team will be left out that's that's awesome absolutely hmm. okay Ah, okay. If anyone else, Paul, uh, William, any uh, closing remarks by you guys? Um, anything they need to know other than get your sleep and get up and select those events? Contact us anytime. Yes, we're very glad to don't, hear from you. Don't be shy. Nice to work with you. And uh, we also hope to include every single team uh, in the events in terms of getting through their requirements of their boards or their communities. Uh, safely and yet uh, getting them on the field and ready to play. Yeah, and um, a reminder, you know, William mentioned earlier about the uh, the coding um, sessions that start this Monday, yeah. but then it alternates with mentor meetings too. So keep those mentor meetings going, uh, attend those things and send information ahead of time. And if you're especially good at something, a key thing that you're better, you know, um, we all have our gaps, right? So there are some things that you're really good at. Uh, let William know that you would like to share um, with the mentor group something about whatever it is you do really well and you know has worked well for your team. Because the I think, you know, for all of us to be the best that we can be and do whatever it takes to be the best we can be, it just helps all of us be better. And you, you all know that those have had a chance to go to Worlds. It's magical when you see how the Canadians band together to support whatever team is going through the ranks towards the finals there. It's just absolutely incredible. Right, Lisa? Lisa would be one of the ones that knows that the most from the last so many years because of 
uh, was it 2018? Was it that long? 19. 19, yeah. On Einstein. How remarkable. Yeah, can't lie. That was pretty cool. Having like, I know all the Canadian teams are out, but then everyone just like swarmed to help and yeah. to like cheer. Like just the whole floor. You just had all the Canadian teams on the floor just cheering and everything. It was great. And there, it, I'm so you know, excited also, to see robots and see everyone compete. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. so excited! Yeah, wouldn't it be great if they did. Uh, you know, we did the mini bot one year. What if we did the uh, FRC game with an FTC mini bot, like an FTC robot no. sidekick? No more. <laughs> no, 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 no. No more mini bots. Big robots oh, or small robots. Don't mix them. You don't want to if, see an FTC robot climb up a no. pole and fall down and crash. No, yeah. because I don't want to see the FRC robot driving over the, the FTC minibot. That's like, no, 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 no. Too much, too much chaos. Yeah. Do not, like, yeah. hurt robots. This is, this is not, not entertaining. It's not fun. Someone spent a lot of time making that little thing, and then it just gets crushed. Rishi oh. agrees. Rishi agrees. I, I know. I'm, I'm looking at the chat. It's hilarious. Um, there's an interesting question about curriculum. As the entire high school curriculum has some kind of connection to FRC, uh, some courses more than others. I wonder if uh, Misa may comment on that as you're part of that F FTC team that's doing that development. Um, I'm gonna hand this off to John because he knows more about this than I do. Okay, I'll, I'll do what I can, Lisa. Um, so okay. if, let's compartmentalize the curriculum. So we got elementary and secondary, right? And secondary is a uh, a very, uh, if I can use the term diverse animal, there's just so many components in secondary. In elementary, especially in grades seven and eights, they begin to shift to, as you know, um, subject focused um, versus generalist. So think about um, science and tech uh, teachers in elementary and grades seven and eight, science and technology. They work from the same document. There's a document specifically for them, curriculum document. So we're looking at that piece and we're trying to map it consistently with what we've already done for FLL. A lot of great work um, from lesson plans to unitization and what have you. That is one of the key pieces right off the hop for FTC. And at the same time, we're looking at where we can chunk common expectations from across several subject areas and secondary because we know um, that FRC is just too big to try to fit into a single course. Um, you can do it if you do an IDC course or an interdisciplinary course, one that allows you to do quarters of four different courses, but no other course allows that other than the, what we call the emphasis courses. So uh, for sure, Dung would know what I'm talking about in any other secondary school teachers that an emphasis course can have a focus in a particular area. So instead of manufacturing, it would be called manufacturing robotics. Instead of design, design robotics. And what can happen now is you can begin to leverage the tool of the robot and all the experiences that go with the team, especially when you look at an FTC robot and how do you deliver the experience in the class? And again, I don't want to use the, you know, the, the uh, how do I say, the past competitors robot program um, to give you a, a scenario, but we have run those in classes in Ontario a lot and a lot of teachers do that very well. So now just think of that being the FTC robot, which is a natural progression between programs from FLL to FTC to FRC, or it could be um, FTC could be the ultimate pinnacle for a particular school, depending on what their needs are. So I'm really excited about this because um, we've been pushing headquarters for the 10 years I've been in this job to get curriculum at the secondary level. And the answer is always, it's too hard to do. We know it's hard to do, just like single day events are, but Ontario's not afraid to do what, what is hard because it's the right thing for our community. And that's the truth. Once you see how much the kids can learn, you would never want to do it any other way. Yeah, and uh, I have to admit that um, I'm a crazy person about uh, curriculum. I know it's hard to believe who would be uh, crazy about curriculum, but the idea that um, uh, how, how it all started for me was years ago, I thought, what are all the hurdles I have as a teacher? And how could I change things to make those hurdles smaller? So what if robotics was part of my course? 
So how do you get robotics to be part of the course? So you put your hand up and you get a job with the ministry to design courses that are gonna be ministry vetted courses that are gonna be delivered at any school in Ontario, as long as the school wants to deliver that course. So think of it this way, you've got whether it's FTC or FRC, and you have a, just pick a subject, computer engineering, computer science in a, in a school. If I get that computer engineering science or um, computer science or computer engineering teacher to teach about all the sensors that have to do with an FTC or FTC robot, that's real world application. They could teach that back to the class who then would build capacity for your robot teams. How brilliant is that? So you're building capacity for the teams. The kids are getting real rich um, activity related curricular experiences and everybody wins. So I think it's fantastic. And the more we can help teachers do that, the better it's gonna be going forward. Okay. Well, I don't, again, uh, back to the point about not holding people hostage. So Paul and William, let's give them 30 more seconds uh, to put something in the chat. And if not, we'll um, say good night to everybody. And thank you so much for coming. I really appreciated the opportunity to explain where we are coming from with the decisions that we've made. And do not hesitate to send us any type of feedback you want. And we are very open to uh, critical feedback along with positive feedback, it doesn't matter. We just want to get it right the best way we can. Okay. Thank you. Right, good night, everybody. Right. Good night, everybody. Thank, thank you so much. Take care. Bye now. Good night. And Roland, we did. Um, I don't know if Roland.